Waymaker this morning. Somebody to make a way in something. You know, we got a world around us that's uh, they're having a lot of troubles. We need God to be a waymaker in the earth today. Not just the political forums, but you know, there's a lot of not just a pandemic. We got depression, we got isolation, we got so many people dealing with mental health issues. We got families and marriages that are being pulled and tugged at. We got people whose bodies are being affected, not just by COVID, but by other sickness. And I wanna give a good report about Daryl and Aaron Weens and young Emily. She's doing well, she's doing better now. We're gonna to continue to pray for her, but being able to come home and uh, coming off of oxygen. So just other areas, but we wanna lift up people in our body like Sharon Swan, who continues to deal with areas in her body after the double lung transplant. Uh, many of us, uh, there, there's areas in our body. We just need a way maker. We need God to come. You know, in John 14, 1, Jesus said, let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. Then he says, I'm gonna give you two things. He says, I'm gonna give you the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the comforter's gonna come, and then I'm gonna bring my peace. And right now, the world needs the power of the Holy Spirit. It also needs the peace of God. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Lord. We pray right now, Lord, for our circumstances, situation around us, Lord. We, we go beyond Edmonton and Alberta. We go to the nation. We go to America, Lord. We go to the world, oh, Lord, where the pandemic is making its way. Lord, we pray healing in the name of Jesus. Lord, turn this pandemic around, oh, God. God, bring your healing. Bring your strength. You are the God that brings a, is a way maker, Lord. So make a way, oh, God. God, make a way for, for hearts and lives to be touched, oh Lord. Let pan, this pandemic cease, oh Lord. Let the waves of this uh, sickness be pushed back, oh God. And God, we pray, oh Lord, for the effects of COVID. God, not only in the bodies of healing, oh Lord, but mental illness and isolation and desperate uh, depression, Lord. Marriages and homes, oh God, where there is just a COVID rage going on in this world today. And we pray, oh God, you touch every heart and life. And God, let the church be the light on the hill. God, a city set up on a hill, oh Lord, that people would know they can come and find the truth of Jesus Christ. God, we need you. God, we need you in our homes. We need you now today more than ever. So Lord, we pray a blessing upon what God, our hearts cry out for. You, oh Lord, come and minister in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. He's a way maker, come on. Well, wave at somebody new that's uh, perhaps sitting next to you and uh, welcome them to the house of God. It's great to have you here this morning. Those that are online, great to have you joining us here at the Pearl Church. If you are not able to join us, uh, please uh, continue to stay connected with us online through Facebook, through uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram. There's many ways you can connect with us. And uh, we really want to constantly hear from everyone, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week as well. So just a couple of announcements. Well, uh, we uh, have opportunity to give with our tithes and offerings unto the Lord through uh, the website, uh, Tithely there. We have all set up for you that you can uh, do so. So go to our website, but also you can do an e-transfer uh, and you can also do a manual with a drop off at the church address if you'd like to as well. Um, when we do come on Sundays, we do need to follow AHS rules. And I do encourage you uh, not only come in with the mask, but leave the mask on throughout our service. Um, there are those that are with us that uh, uh, we're so grateful that they're able to come, but they are perhaps in a, more of a category that they are more susceptible. So we want to protect them. Uh, wearing a mask protects us from you and my wearing a mask protects you from me. So uh, there is a reason behind it. So we want to just follow those rules 
and be compliant with what God is doing in the earth through our government as well. So please make note of that. We want to pray for you. Uh, we're we're going to talk about prayer, but can I just tell you, prayer works. And uh, not just in your life, but that we can pray for you. So uh, send us your prayer requests. Let us be able to stand in, in the intercessory gap, as it were, and be able to pray God's blessing on your life and encourage you. So let us know how we can pray for you. Uh, talk to the leader. Send it in by email, uh, Facebook. So many ways you can connect with us and be a part of what God is doing in the earth. Well, great to have you here this morning. Um, if you're a visitor, my name's Jeff Harmon, and with my lovely wife, Lori, we have planted this church not quite uh, five years ago. Really, this is the time when we really heard from God, and then we launched the church in January of 16. So we're coming up to our fifth year anniversary. I'm excited about that, uh, but uh, it's just a, uh, one of the markers on the journey of life, and we can say, well, yeah, we hit that marker, but we're moving on. There's more for us, what God has for us, so we look forward to that. Um, this morning, we are continuing our series. We're talking about values, what we value. And uh, what you value, you put your time and energy into. If you value your spouse, well, you're going to spend time with her. You're also going to spend finances on her. You're also going to spend energy doing things with her that perhaps you would never do. But you value her, you value her, and you put your time and energy into that. While you value your vehicle, you're going to look after it a little better because you value it. You're going to clean it. You're going to spend time on it. You're going to get it to the car wash. You're going to get it in for maintenance regularly. Why? Because you value it. Well, our values are pretty clear, not just on a website, but you find it in the Word of God. And uh, uh, in the Word of God, the church has values that it's built on, that it's predicated uh, by principles of how we function and operate. We talked about that the church has a mission. We're here for a reason. We're not here just to gather and be a social club. We're here ultimately with the same reason that Jesus Christ came to earth, and that is to reach, save, rescue the lost, tell people about Jesus Christ. We're not here just to be comfortable and just make it a, a fun time for us to be hanging together. There's a purpose, and it's the same mission that Jesus Christ came for. Well, we also have in that mission, the next step would be to belong. We are calling people to belong, belong together into a community, into a family, into a body, into a community. There's a place for everyone here. People say, well, don't I have to believe before I can belong? No, that's not the way Jesus did it. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You follow me first, come and belong with me. And then as together we will walk and we'll come to know what you need to know. We'll do it on a journey. So we belong, but we're also a church that values the presence of God. We are presence driven, not program driven. People ask, well, why don't you have this or this or this? Why, why aren't you putting your time and energy into this? Well, those are good things, but the key thing that has to be first and foremost is the presence of God. Out of the presence, we can do those other things. As God directs us and leads us, we will do what God calls us to do, but the first place that we put our value is into the presence of God. So worship and community and uh, prayer times and preaching and everything, it's all about setting it up for you to engage in the presence of God. Because God changes everything. If we come in and we leave the same way, then somehow we didn't meet with God. Because when you meet with God, you'll come out changed. You'll come out different. You'll come in one way and go out the other way, Ezekiel tells us, as we go into the presence of God. We come out a different way. So it's not just the presence of God. We also talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about valuing the outpouring and the filling of the presence of God. When we're born again, we have Christ in us, but we have to be filled in a constant filling of the presence of God in our personal lives. Jesus said that I will not leave you orphans. I won't leave you as a comfortless. I'm going to send another, a comforter, an advocate. I'm going to send the presence of God that will come into a manifestation form in your life so that you become filled up with his power and his life, and you'll have this personality that's on the inside of you that begins to, as it were, take over, not because it overrules your own will, but because it becomes so violently alive inside of you. You go, that's the presence of God. And then also, we talk about today, prayer. Prayer, we're a church that values prayer. Well, we don't just value it by talking about it and putting it on our website. We give you times and opportunities to pray. We have pre-service prayer. Every uh, service uh, prior to from 9.30 to 9.50 where we can come and we can pray individually but corporately, pray for the service, pray for our community. Uh, up until recently, we had prayer walks where we'd go out into the community and, and we would pray. We'd go as it were up and down the streets and just say, God, touch this home, touch this family, touch this marriage. God, we pray for the children. We pray for the businesses. What are we doing? We're saying, God, we're interceding for the people that you've given us influence over. 
And uh, we'd then come and we'd pray here. But prayer is so important. We value prayer, not only as a believer, but also as a community, that we would be a people of prayer, not just that we can talk about it, but that we could, amen, do it. So we're going to talk about prayer. You know, all the way from uh, we understand what prayer is. There's so many concepts, so many things I could teach you that you probably already know, and some of you would say you even maybe know more a little bit about prayer than I do, and that's okay. In this basic form, prayer is simply our communion with God. That we come into a relationship with God where we can talk, where we can converse, where we can share our heart, we can come into an intimacy with God in prayer. We talk with God, not just to God, but with God. But it's this communion. And from Genesis to Revelation, you will find all 66 books will have woven within those chapters God's call to humanity, to you and I, to come back into communion. He's constantly calling us to come and reason with me, he says. Come and bring your talk, your conversation, your, your ailments. Come, and, come to me and bring me what you have going on in your life. He says, I want to get involved. But prayer becomes the permission we say, God, I give it to you. I'm inviting you in. I yield my life over to you. And if I was to use a word that would help describe this communion, this prayer, it is simply the word withness. You can say, well, that, that ain't a word. I know it's not a word. But if I was to use a word, it would be withness. It's with him. It's the with action. It's being with God. Prayer, we go about all day and we go, well, yeah, God's everywhere. God's all around. Yeah, but were you with him? Did you take time out to be with God? Did you talk to God? Did you commune with God? Was there a, a pattern of withness in, in your life for the day? Or did you only have a with God on Sunday? And prayer is that action of withness. I, I'm with God. I'm talking to God. I'm communing with God. I'm, I'm relating to God. Back, back in Genesis, God created Adam and Eve, and he creates his, his crowning creation, not just putting them in the garden, but he says, I want to be with you. There was a withness right at the beginning where God said to Adam and Eve, I want you to, to guard the garden. I want you to work it, till it. I want you to guard it and protect it, but I want you to be with me. So it says that twice that in the cool of the day, Adam and Eve would hear the voice of God. There in the garden in the cool of the day, there's a voice. There was a talking with God. There was a communing with God. There was a withness with God. But it's interesting, back in those days, there was no asking God for anything because they had everything. There was no problems, there's no sin, there's no disruptions, there was no activities going on in the world that they had to pray to God for because everything was perfect. They, they, had, they, they had no reason to ask God for anything. They had no kids. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. They had no in-laws. They had nothing to ask God for help about. Everything was perfect. They simply wanted to be with and prayer in its basic sense is being with God, spending time with him, praying, talking to him, sharing your life with him. But then what happens? Sin enters in, Adam and Eve. They fall for the deception of the enemy. They take of the forbidden fruit, as it were, which is just a disobedience to God, saying, God, I can rule my life better than you can rule them. And God says, well, that's fine. Now you have to leave. There's a, there's a judgment. And they had to leave the presence of God. And since that time of leaving the presence of God, God has been in, 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 his, in his redemptive act all the way through history up until Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's all about redeeming God, man, people, man, and bringing us back into right relationship so that we could be with him. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no man comes unto the Father except by me. With God, withness only happens through Jesus Christ. And salvation made a way that we could come back to be with God. And then God says, well, and part of that withness is that relationship that we could restore once again that Adam and Eve had back in the garden where all of a sudden you can talk with me. You can share your heart. You can be with me. You know, if I was to ask anyone here, who here does not need to have more passion in your prayer? Who here does not need to spend more time in prayer? Who here is not, needs a little more discipline in your prayer life? No, no, no hand will go up. Because we all know we could be doing just a little better. We could be spending a little more time being with God. If I was to ask one question, come up to anybody, and I wanted to find out how your spiritual life is with Jesus Christ, your walk with God, I would ask one question, how's your prayer life? Because your prayer life goes, there goes your walk with God. Our prayer life, any relationship, 
How much time are you spending with somebody? How much time are you talking to? How much time are you, are you basking in their presence will determine how healthy your relationship is, whether it's your spouse, your children, your workplace, wherever it is. If you don't spend time with them, you won't have a healthy relationship. And so it is with our relationship with God. Prayer is about that walk with the Lord. Prayer is about giving God back dominion in your life. Back in Genesis, creation, Adam and Eve were given dominion, authority. But they lost that dominion with that relationship with God. And prayer with you and I through Christ now is saying, God, I give you dominion over my life. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What are we praying? We're praying his dominion, not only in the earth, but in our life. We're saying, God, your rulership, your reignship, come into me today. I'm not going to fight you anymore. It's giving back authority, giving back this this, uh, control aspect that we want to have control over our lives, but instead we give it back to God. Prayer is inviting God into your now, today, whatever you're struggling with. Prayer is saying, God, come in. I invite you in now to this. Not just the future, not just my past, but now, today. And, And why do we need to pray? Because our now Wherever our now is, right now, our now needs God. It needs, we need God in our marriages, in our home, in our families. We need God in our finances. We need God in our body, in our health, our mind. We, need God. we just need God. And prayer is that invitation that says, God, I need you in my now, right here, right now. Well, I want you to understand that there's a battle going on. There's a battle going on in your life and in my life in the spiritual walk that we have today. There's a battle going on against our communion with God. I don't know if you've noticed it. It's amazing how many things can interrupt my communion with God. My work gets in the way. My home life gets in the way. It's like everything gets in the way of me just wanting to spend time with God because I get so spread out and so many other things. It's like, oh, man, I forgot to have that witness that I so desperately need. We get so caught up in so many other things that are going on in life today. There's a battle going on, not just in the believers, but also in the area of the church. Day of Pentecost, 10 days before that, there was 120 people that got together to pray in the upper room according to the command of the Lord. Jesus said, I want you to tarry. I want you to wait. It means I want you to call out, get press in. I want you to get a hold of my presence before my presence even shows up. And 120 people were up in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 when finally the Holy Spirit was poured out and it came like tongues of fire, mighty rushing wind. There's a sound and then there's a, a, a worship that went out of the people as the Holy Spirit fell on them. They began to worship in languages that other people go, wow, that, that's not their language. And I'm hearing it and there's a manifestation and Peter preaches a sermon. 3,000 people get added to the church. And all of a sudden the church is birthed in Acts chapter 2. And then all of a sudden there's a battle that goes on against the church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Come on, he's building a church, but there's opposition. There are gates, authorities, there are pressings against the church, not just against believers, but against the workings of God in the earth. From the day that the church was birthed, in Acts chapter 2, you flip the page to Acts chapter 3, and Peter and John, they heal somebody at the gate, beautiful, lift him up. This, young, this man that was a, a paralytic from birth, all of a sudden he steps up, gets healed, and what does he do? He has a religious opposition come and says, by what authority do you do this? And they began to not only pull that man that got healed down and his family down, but they went after Peter and John. There's opposition to the move of God. There's opposition to the church And I I, I think if we understood the opposition right now that's going on in your life, that's going on in this church, we would be praying a lot more. If we could truly see in the spiritual realm the opposition that's taking place, but not just the opposition, what's at stake? What's at stake is your marriage. What's at stake is the next generation. What's at stake is the health and welfare of so many souls that are around us day in and day out. Our family members, there's so much at stake that if we knew really what was at stake, we would be praying more than we're doing anything else. We'd be mindful of the battle that's going on. And I believe we have to understand this. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, it's a beautiful passage. If you haven't read it recently, we're going to touch it, Ephesians 6, 10. He's writing to his church at Ephesus where it was demonic. There was a a city full of idolatry and uh, uh, um, Greek mythology and so many other things going on. And he writes about this, about the battle. And he says, finally, my brethren, 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Believers, listen to me. We are at war. There might not be bombs flying and, and different things happening in the earth today in the natural, but spiritually, we are in a war. We're in a battle. There is a war raging, not just against your soul, but against your future, against the promises of God, against the blessings of God, against your neighbors and connections. There is such a disruption going on in the spiritual realm. He talks about spiritual forces called principalities and powers and rulers and spiritual hosts of wickedness. He's just not trying to come up with some dramatic way to talk about Satan. No, there are levels and and and. Uh, realms and there are henchmen as it were workers of, of demonic forces when Satan fell and took a third of his angels with him what happened we, it became a demonic force that worked into the earth to go against God's promises and his pursuit of bringing life eternal life into this world he, we do not war against flesh and blood but there is flesh and blood involved because there's those that get their minds twisted and they, they get following other things and they become pawns, as it were. They become uh, people that the enemy uses. But we got to know that there's forces behind. There, there's things going on behind that we got to be praying and dealing with. And he tells us that we have to be dressed. We have to have armor. We can't just, go. when we come to the kingdom of God, we don't come in as tourists. Oh, isn't this so sweet? Oh, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Oh, I just love all the joy and peace. And man, it's just so, and it's just like we're going around as tourists. No, we come in as soldiers. The Bible calls us soldiers. We, we are fellow soldiers. We are warriors. We are men and women who come in and we got to put on the armor of God because there are forces that we have to deal with. Colossians 1 13 says, For Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom uh, of his son he loves. We're going from one kingdom of one dominion, one reign, one rule, one spiritual opposition. And he says he stole us out of there through his redemption and he translated us to another kingdom. We go, oh, I'm out of that kingdom and I'm into this kingdom. Darkness, light, uh, the devil into Jesus. But there's still a battle that goes on. The enemy forces continue to war against you and I. If he can't stop you from being saved, he'll stop you from entering into the fullness of Jesus Christ. He'll have addictions and habits and thought lives and different areas of your carnal life. He'll attack those areas and twist them up and begin to use them. Why? To hold you back from the fullness that God has for you. So we pray. Prayer is so important in your life and my life. Prayer is so important in the church. And we begin to read in John 10 how Jesus said, I came to bring life and life more abundantly. But Satan, who's the, who's the father of all lies, he's a liar. He says he comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. That means those are active words. Not just he did that, he's doing it. He is alive and well today, still trying to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's a, what's called the prince of the power of this air, scriptures call it. He's, there's, there's waves, uh, uh, like his word, like cell phone waves. It's their unseen forces, invisible, but they're there, just like you would see in a radio and a cell phone. There's a result that happens because of these forces. You know, in Acts chapter 4, as the church moves on and from chapter 2 to chapter 3 into chapter 4, we find in chapter 4 we've got uh, uh, um, all of a sudden Peter and John are arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're told, hey, you can't preach in the name of Jesus. You can't talk about the gospel. You can't bring healing in the name of Jesus anymore. In Acts chapter 4, all of a sudden there's pressure against the church. What does the church do? We'll have a picket. We'll protest. We'll get 100 people together and we'll just tell everybody what we believe and why it's so wrong and our rights are being infringed. That's not what they did. The early church got together and they says, no, we're just going to pray. They began to pray in Acts chapter 4. Listen to this, verse 29. This is their prayer. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. It's a subversive word. It's like defined. He says, we're going to preach your word, stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word with boldness. Something happens when church gets together. 
When church begins to pray, when church begins to respond to the circumstances around us, all of a sudden God shows up and says, okay, let me show up now with a strong arm and bring healing and bring miracles because the church is calling out. The church with prayer makes a difference to the world around us. It's not just for us. It's for the world around us that we can pray and we can make a difference. In Acts chapter 12, it goes on, and there's so many other battles in there. I'm just picking up a couple. Acts 12, Herod the king, grandson of, of uh, Herod the great, he kills the apostle James. All the Jews love it. So Herod goes, awesome, I got Peter. I'm going after Peter now. Locks Peter up into prison. He says, I'm going to kill Peter now. And as soon as the Passover is over, celebration is over, we're going to have another one. You know, we got forces around us constantly today that are trying to take out leaders, trying to take out influencers, trying to take out people in your life that, that can put a deposit in you, cause you to be scattered and out of the fold, as it were, even. But you know, all of a sudden, a church begins to pray, and it says in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Constant prayer was offered for, to him by the church. The church says, hey, we're going to start interceding. We're going to be standing, there, standing in the gap, interceding. We're going to be representatives of God on the earth and begin to call out to God. And because they began to call out to God, when you read Acts chapter 12, an angel shows up. Peter's in prison asleep. He wasn't praying, but a church was praying. And Peter, all of a sudden, the angel comes and says he smote him on the side of the head. He woke him up. He says, Peter, don't you want to get delivered? There's a church praying for you. Why aren't you praying? And he wakes Peter up, and all of a sudden, Peter gets dressed, and they begin to walk out of that prison, and the angel opens up one door after another until Peter is finally on the outside. In Acts chapter 12, he goes to the very place where the church is praying. He knocks on the door. They don't believe it's him. They think it's a spirit. They don't let him in. Peter can get out of prison, but he can't get into a prayer meeting. All of a sudden, Peter goes in, and they realize what had happened. You know, it tells, reminds me of the story down in Texas, the church was praying about a bar that was wanting to be built, and this bar was nothing but degrading and wrong. It was all darkness, and they're praying for this bar not to be built. So they got together, and they prayed and prayed and prayed, and finally they got the permit, and that bar got built. They thought, what happened? We're praying against this thing. They started praying even more. All of a sudden, one day, a storm hit, and the lightning struck and destroyed the bar. The church is, woo, we got it. God answers prayers. It's awesome. Well, the bar owner took the church to court. Told the judge that they were involved. They were involved in the demise of their church because they prayed to God and God turned around and caused this to happen. And all of a sudden, the representative of the church goes, no, we don't believe that. We had nothing to do with it. Come on, it wasn't our prayers, it was just lightning struck. It's an act of, of Mother Nature did that. We're not going to court for this. The judge took the two claims and looked at him and go, I got a quandary here. I got some unbelieving people that believe God struck them down because of prayer. And then I got a church that was praying but doesn't believe that God did that. And sometimes... What are we praying for? And do we believe God is really doing what he's doing? Because if we really believe God could do those things, I think we'd be praying a lot more. We would be making a difference in the lives around us. In Acts chapter 12, you know, we don't war against that flesh and blood, but we do war against the spiritual forces behind it. There's a war going on. There's a war going on around us. In Ephesians 6, Paul outlines the armor. We're not going to touch on it. That's a hundred, not another sermon. But I just want to tell you, he says, you know, put on the whole armor of God, not just one piece, not just the piece that looks good on you. Get it all on you. Because when you go out into war, there's a battle not just in front of you, but it's all around you. You've got to be able to protect yourself. What do you do? You get the belt of truth. First of all, truth, Jesus Christ, everything hangs on truth. The belt, without your belt, everything falls off, so you get the truth on you. You get the, hel you get the uh, uh, belt of truth. You get the breastplate of righteousness, not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. You got our feet covered with the gospel of peace. We, everywhere we go, we got the word going with us, the shield of faith, able to quench the fiery darts, the accuser of the brethren, shooting those enemies, our, our fiery darts at us. We can, we can snuff them out. The helmet of salvation, get our mind redeemed. We get five defensive ones, and it gives us two offensive ones. And the first one 
is we got to be able to handle the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We get the Word of God in our life and we can handle, like Jesus Christ, the attack of the enemy. We can quote Scripture. We can speak Scripture. Our mind takes the Scriptures and it goes against the enemy. It's a sword, a double-edged sword, a powerful sword. But secondly, he says this in Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. He says, praying always, and then he says this, with all prayer. And then he says, goes on, he says, it's in the spirit. There is something about the groanings and cryings and the fervency and the passion and the emptying yourself out to God when you go to battle. That you just don't go into a battle and go, talk to the hand, and he's going to do it. No. There are times we've got to be able to get into this warfare, this attitude, this prevailing aspect of prayer, calling out to God. Prayer is in our arsenal and has to be pulled out on a daily basis. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We, we, it's like we all know what we, t- we are to do. It's just we don't do it. I'm, just remi- I'm the CRO of the, th- the Pearl, the chief reminding officer. That's what a preacher does. I'm just reminding you of what you already know. But I'm hoping you get this afresh, that we're in a battle. It's a war zone, and we've got to be not only uh, have the armor on us, we've got to have these weapons. But I want to take you to Acts 16. In Acts 16, we've got a battle that takes place, and I just want to build for you and hopefully get this in your heart and life. In Acts 16, verse 16, it says, now it happened. It starts off, now it happened. It's like Luke, who's writing this book of Acts, is telling everybody as you're reading this is now. Now it happened. Gloves came off. Now you want to see the church? You want to see the church in a battle? You want to see what's happening in believers' lives? It says, now it happened. And if I could, I could get you just to think of this Acts chapter 16, where all of a sudden in Philippi, the Lydia became a first convert, a woman of seller of purple, and down by the river, here's Paul, and all of a sudden, uh, The church of Philippi gets birthed. Their things are going. It's all great. But then all of a sudden, the enemy rises up. And it says in verse 16, now it happened as we went to prayer. As we went to prayer. When the church gets minded to go to prayer, the enemy rises up. When you will go to prayer, the enemy will do what he can to distract you, get your mind off of him, to all of a sudden cause you to just all of a sudden weaken down and say, well, maybe prayer is not so important. When they went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us. The opposition rose up. Church is being birthed. They're going to a, an hour of prayer. They're calling out on God, and all of a sudden the enemy comes up. It's a demonic spirit. It's a spirit of divination, of, of telling the future. And this girl with the spirit all of a sudden followed the apostle Paul and uh, uh, the, the leaders with him, and, and he, she would simply cry out. And it was the truth what she cried out, but she says that these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. You know, telling the truth, but it was the wrong spirit. It was a spirit of divination. And all of a sudden, Paul, he's getting annoyed. It didn't happen a little bit. It didn't happen just part of the day. It was happening too long, and finally he gets annoyed. And I believe there's so many things going on in the spirit today, but we're just not getting annoyed at it. We're accepting it. We're just saying, well, that's just life. Oh, you know, this kind of things that are going on in the world today and this demonic spirits and all these other things that are happening in the spirit realm, just the way life is. Ah, don't worry about it. Just sort of get used to it. Paul says, no, he got annoyed. And I believe we got to get annoyed at some of the things going on and that annoyance will drive us to prayer. It'll drive us to do something about it. Paul, he sees this woman and it's happening again and again and finally he turns to her and says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. <laughs> he says, I had enough. And I believe sometimes we have enough, where enough is enough, and we get involved and we get to pray, we get to lay hands on people, we get to see sicknesses healed, demons cast out, we begin to see lives changed. Why? Because we're tired of seeing what the devil's doing in the earth today. And we get upset enough that we go to prayer and we begin to do something about it. But let me t- tell you, the battle doesn't end just because of that. You know, this spirit of divination, just I want to remind you, in the Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible tells us to stay, have nothing to do with it, have nothing to do with the occult, the, have nothing to do with Ouija boards and seances and, and all these tarot cards and anything out there. Go, well, those are just games. No, they're not just games. Those are 
openings of the enemy. Those are giving the enemy a foothold into spirituality, into areas of darkness. It'll take you away from Jesus, not towards Jesus. So we have nothing to do with those things. I love in the book of Acts that there was a time when the Holy Spirit rose up that they says that they collected all their magic books. All the demonic things that were in our homes, they grabbed them all and they had a, had a book burning party. They just got rid of everything. I'm not saying that, that we have to go back to that, but it's just that aspect of removing those things out of our lives so they don't have a foothold in us. Amen? I believe, yeah, okay, going to move on. Greatly annoyed. And all of a sudden, in the name of Jesus, cast her out. And, uh, you know, we're doing what Jesus called us to do, didn't he? He says, go and preach the gospel, baptizing them, teaching them, casting out demons, signs and wonders. Well, I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. Got to go back to the word, but I'm pretty sure that's what this church is called to do. It says you had this woman, this spirit. The Greek word for this divination, this word divination, is actually the word Python. I know where you're going already. It means the spirit of Python. Snakes have poison, but this one didn't have a poison. This one had the subtlety of making its way to its prey and slowly wrapping itself around the prey until finally he could what? Squeeze the breath out of it and they would die of suffocation. And then he would go ahead and take hold of it. Choking, suffocating pressing it until all the air is taken out of it. And I believe that there's an enemy that wants to take the breath out of us, the breath that we use to praise and prayer and worship God. Because you see, you can't, you can't pray without breath. You can meditate, but you can't pray. You need to form words. You can't worship without breath. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Jesus said, when you pray, say, you need breath for, for those things to happen. And I, I believe that there is an enemy today that wants to go and attack the church and say, hey, quiet. Don't lift your voice up. Don't pray. Don't be a praying church. Just, you know, people don't like people praying out loud. It's awkward. And worship, well, you know, worship is just, you know, sometimes distracting. And really, you know, I think that the noise level and everything, you know, let's just tone it down. Let's just not really get too hyper and too excited. Let's just sort of have a sing-along, kumbaya. But the church is called to worship. The church is called to pray. The church is called to have praise. 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about all scriptures given by the inspiration of God. That word inspiration is breath. It's given by the breath of God. God breathed. This word right here, the scriptures, God breathed them out holy men of old, it says, were moved on by the Spirit and wrote them. But it was the pneuma, the breath, the life of God that came out. God breathed the Scriptures. When we pray, what are we doing? We're praying out the breath of, that's inside of us in worship to God. And when we read the Scriptures, we're breathing in the very breath of God. We breathe out, we breathe in. Church is about the exchanging of air where we breathe out in worship and prayer and then we take in the Word of God. Jesus, we know when he said, and we talk, talked about this the other week, when he talked to his disciples in John 20, he says, uh, receive the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And what was there? There was wind. There was a mighty raging wind. There was the breath that went out. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. And the word Holy Spirit is not even really in the language that it was written in. They, they didn't know what to call it. They called it pneuma. They called it breath. They called it wind, which is the same word. Don't know how to explain it, so they threw in their Holy Spirit. It's about the breath of God. And I believe one of the enemy tactics today is take the breath out of the church. Get it to stop praying. Get it to stop worshiping. Get it stop with the move of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And that python spirit came into Paul's life and began to come against him, to hold him back. The church, it's moving, it's going. No, the python says, let's squeeze it. Paul was brought into charge against, uh, by false accusations because he, he cast out this demon out of this worker uh, and, and her boss says, hey, we can't make any money off of her now. They don't have a demonic spirit in there to tell the future, so we're losing our money. And so they brought him to court and they had false accusations and, and Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. Not just thrown into prison, they're thrown into an inner prison. Now, I want you to see this. 
Paul, first of all, he's, he says he's thrown in stock, so he's, he's shackled. Then he's beaten on the bottom of his feet, so he can't even walk on it anymore. There's, there's stripes that go on his body. He's, he's bleeding. He's, his body has no strength left. And then it says that they're put into prison. Then he's put into the inner prison, and the guard was to keep him. It means to squish him, to secure him tightly. Can you see the python working through flesh? Let's put him in prison. Let's, let's squeeze him out. Let's, let's hold him down. Let's, let's put him in stocks and chains and everything and tighter, 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 tighter. Paul and Silas are there at midnight. And how do you respond to this demonic spirit? How do you respond to this python that wants to squeeze the breath out of them? They began to worship God. They began to call on God. They began to seek God. It says at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They weren't complaining, oh God, how could you? We were doing this for you and look what you did to us. God, where have you been? God, how come it's us? Why, why is this happening? None of that. It says they began to pray and praise. They began to worship and intercede. They began to call on God. They began to put that breath into action. It says, Python, you aren't going to squeeze the breath out of us. We're going to use our very last breath to praise God. They began to worship God. They began to lift up God. They began to sing songs unto God. Paul understood Ephesians 5.16. It says that if you will uh, begin to be filled with the Spirit, how? Singing to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The devil made a mistake putting Paul and Silas together because they had church. They're in the prison. They began to worship God. And because of that, it says that the doors swung open, prison shook, doors opened, chains were loose, prisoners were set free, an earthquake came, foundations were shaked up because they began to call on God. And as a result, the jailer who thought he should kill himself began to see what God had done. And he says, what must I do to be saved? What can I do to have what you have? And Paul just says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they were saved, water baptized, began to serve Paul, began to clean his wounds, and they were used by God. The spirit of Python wants to squeeze the breath out of believers and leaders and the churches. So why do we come and have a pre-service prayer? Why do we gather to worship? Why do we gather to have the scriptures breathed out onto your life? Because we are in a war. We are battling an enemy, and prayer is the key. Prayer and praise and the scriptures, but prayer is while we pick up the offense against the enemy and we say, no, not today, devil. Devil, not today. We begin to pray unto God. Prayer is simply handing dominion and authority back to God. God, this church, why do we pray? Because, God, you have dominion and authority over this church. Why do we pray in our homes and our marriages and grab our spouses? God, you have dominion and authority right now over our marriage, over our home, over our job, over our finances. We begin to pray over our children. We pray over our grandchildren. We pray because we're giving God, God, your dominion, your authority. And we push back the attacks of the enemy. I'm not giving you anything more than you perhaps have already known, but let me give you three things to make it practical. Number one, Set time and a place for prayer. If you think prayer is just going to happen without you planning for it, it's not. You are, right now, we are so busy. The biggest obstacle to prayer in my life and in yours is that we're too busy. We're too busy to pray. We're too busy to make a priority out of prayer. And that's all of us. We fight to make sure that we have time in our day to pray. We've got to make it a a priority. We're too distracted, too addicted to our social media. We can say we don't have time, but can I tell you, by the age of 21, the research was done by the age of 21. Now, the average guy spends 10,000 hours playing video games. Call of Duty, boop, got it. Whatever it is, This might not be you, but this is what's out there. Listen to this. The average American spends 700 hours each year on social media and 2,700 hours on TV. I just don't have time to pray. My life is so busy. Really? And I'm speaking to me. I'm not just speaking to you. I'm speaking to me. We get so busy and distracted by the vain things of life 
that what really makes a difference in your life will be prayer, and your schooling, and your relationships, and your activities. So instead of playing Candy Crush on the bus to school, work of prayer, you know, we pray, we talk to God, we invite him, hand over dominion authority, but set a time and a place, make an appointment. Number two, can I tell you pray specifically? General prayers get general answers. Specific prayers get specific answers. If your prayer is, oh, God, I just want to have a good day today. Really? You got all access to the throne of grace? God, just give me a good day. I just want to be able to have a good day today, Lord God. Can I tell you what good maybe is to God? A little trial, persecution, suffering. A little bit about working some difficulty in your life so that you become all of a sudden more dependent on him, more Christ-like. Various trials that happen in our life. Why? So we can become more like Christ. Yeah, I just want a good day, but no, no hard things. General prayers get general answers. Specific prayers get specific. Paul and Silas, they're, they're in prison. They're not going, oh, God. Oh, we have a good sleep tonight, Lord. Oh, I just been missions have been just really hard on us lately, and I could just use a good sleep tonight, Lord. They weren't praying that kind of prayer. They were praying, God, get us out of here. God, I want to see a miracle. God, I want to see the doors open up. I want to see all of a sudden people get saved. God, there's prisoners in amongst us. God, even if we don't get out, I hope these people get saved. They were specific in their prayers. Now, if you're praying like this, Lord, I just, I just want a boyfriend. Can I just have a boyfriend? Like, no, I don't have a boyfriend. I'd like a boyfriend. You better not just be praying for that. Because you might just get just a boyfriend. People say, well, hey, what's your boyfriend like? It's cool. No, no, really, what, what's your boyfriend like? Well, he makes me laugh. Really? Like, like the boyfriend you got, well, what's he like? He's got a dog. It's pretty cool. Yeah, okay, but does he have any aspirations? Does he have any desires? Does he, does he, does he want to own a car? Does he, instead of taking a bus, does he, does he want to uh, uh, move out from mom? Does, does he want to end up with a job, go to school? Uh, are you, is he godly and righteous? Is he kind and gentle? Like, what, what, what kind of guy is him? I got a boyfriend. General prayers get general answers. If I could encourage you, man, I, I know uh, a sister, man, she had her page after page of specific things that she wanted in a man, and she got them all. She will testify to you. Most of you don't even know who she is, but she'll tell you. She waited, but she got the man she prayed for. Guys, don't look at me like that. Man, I'm smoking hot. That's all I want. Really? General prayers will get general answers. Specific prayers get specific answers. And can I just tell you this? I believe you need to be matching your dilemma up with your prayers. Oh, man, this is life and death. Are you praying like it? Oh, I don't know what's going to happen in my life if this doesn't happen. Are, are you praying like that? Are you matching your prayer to your dilemma? Do you say life is, need, you need this so badly? How badly are you praying? How badly are you calling out to God? How badly are you fasting? Jesus said some of these things don't happen unless you have prayer and fasting. Yeah, I kind of like my food. I'm not really sure about wanting to give up, you know, fasting just to, well, then you really don't want to change in your life. Prayer and fasting, seeking God, praying to God. Pray specifically. Let me give you number three. I believe you need to know that God wants to reveal his glory by answering your prayers. God's not up there with his arms crossed and a stern face go, call that prayer. I'm not going to answer that. That's a silly question. God says, no, I want to answer your prayer because when I answer your prayer, your faith builds and you'll ask for more. Then when all of a sudden you see people get healed around you because you've been praying for them, you will start praying more. You will start praying deeper. You will start praying, praying more passionately. God wants to answer your prayers. God wants to show himself strong on your behalf. Why? Because you will become more full of faith, that you will pray more things and more things will be done. I believe we need to have a higher expectation of answered prayer. I don't know if you heard that. We need to have a higher expectation of answered prayer, that we believe God can answer. 
that God is a way maker. God is a healer. God is a deliverer. God wants to bless you in the natural realms of finances and jobs and relationships. It's not about the money. It's about God wanting to reveal himself strong in your life. God wants to minister to you and encourage you. Prayer is a weapon. There's a battle going on. And prayer is the key to the victory. Prayer is that weapon. But we've got to handle it like a weapon. Not like a toy, not like some spatula that we just hold up and try to battle with. Prayer becomes something we are focused in and we realize God, it works. We're a church that prays. We become passionate. James 5.16 says this, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much of a man, a woman who, who seeks God and they're fervent and there's an effectiveness that happens. Great power produces wonderful results. God is a God that brings things back to life. God wants to bring things back to life, but he wants us to pray. Ask, seek, and knock. Those are continual words. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Prayer makes a difference. So we're a church that values prayer. And I believe we need to be a people individually that become prayer warriors, become people of prayer, become people that say, I understand that prayer works, and I want to pray more. I want to pray so that the devil doesn't have the inroads that he thinks he has in my life. I want to pray against my thoughts that come my way. Every one of us gets those thoughts. We get depression. We get anxiety. We get certain things that the enemy wants to put a blanket over us and weigh us down. We need to be those that rise up and speak against those things. Take the promises of God. Take the scriptures. We begin to go to war against these things. We begin to pray for souls. We begin to pray for marriages. We pray because prayer works and because we're in a battle that wants to hold us back. So, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we just stand up for a minute here before we get enter into worship? I believe we're just going to take a moment of prayer and ask God, God, give me a faith. Give me a faith to believe that prayer works. Because I believe sometimes we get to the place of tiredness that our prayer doesn't work. I prayed for a while and it didn't happen, so I'm not going to stop praying. We need a fresh move of God in our hearts and our lives to believe in prayer. Some of you are going through difficulties that you've been going through a long time, and you say, oh, I haven't seen a change now. Why? Revelation chapter 8 talks about the incense bowls that are in heaven. It says that the incense bowls are filled with the prayers of the saints. It has a beautiful picture. It says when the bowl is full, it tips over and God begins to manifest. I don't know when the bowl is going to be full for you. The point is don't stop praying. Because one day that bowl will be full and things are going to happen. Our job is to pray. It's God's job to do. Father, I pray right now, Lord, even as, as we call out to you, say, God, would you give us, give us fresh faith to believe that our prayers work, that you hear our prayers, that you respond to our prayers. Lord, you said that if we will believe and we will ask in your name, it will happen. James says that if we will ask, we receive, as long as we don't ask in doubt and lack of faith. So, God, we, we ask right now for fresh faith to believe that as a church, we can pray. As a church, we can make a difference. Our prayers make a difference. It makes a difference in our homes, in our marriages, in our finances, in our children. It makes a difference in our parents. It makes a difference. You gave us prayer. Help us, Lord, to use it. Lord, we pray right now for this church to be a praying church. God, we don't want to just come and not be changed. We need to be changed. Prayer changes us. We submit our hearts and our lives to you. If you have needs, we want to pray with you. We want to encourage you, but God's called you to pray. I'll pray for you, but God's called you to pray. I'll pray for your home. I'll pray for your family, but God's called you to pray. We will pray in agreement. Lord Jesus, whatever the heart's crying out for right now, Lord, I pray that you would uh, meet their needs, meet their answers, or their, their call out to you, Lord, and show yourself strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
thing that's going to make a difference in your journey down the road. So you can be on the journey for 30 years but have never gotten out of the starting gate. Or you can be saved for 30 days and you're miles down the road. What makes a difference in a believer's life following Christ and to get you down the road, the journey? Well, there's various things that God has given us. It calls us, number one, to read the scriptures. Word of God becomes that instrument that propels us down the road because we become more like Christ. We be changed into His image from glory to glory. The Scriptures speak to us. It reveals us who Jesus is. So you read the Bible. Number two, the community. We're never meant to be Christians to do Christianity alone, independently, by ourselves. We're meant to do it in community. People say, well, no, I, just, I love God. I just don't like the church. Well, the church is Jesus' bride. You love the bride of your Savior. You come into right relationship, community, get plugged in. Things like worship. You give your life to pouring out to God, adoration, gratitude. You, you understand what worship is. Jesus said that the Father's seeking worshipers, those that worship in spirit and in truth. So God is seeking you out right now. Are you responding? So worship. But one of the greatest ones is prayer. Your intimacy, your communion with God will move you down the journey. People say, well, I've been saved for 30 years. How come I've never had this kind of relationship with God? Well, have you spent time with him? Have you become like a David that waited on God constantly? Have you become a Paul who cut away from the distractions of life, went to Arabia, why? To just, just get that relationship so tight with God. Are you like the Lord who had a certain place that he went every day, went into the wilderness for days, nights, just praying because he needed the Father. He needed a relationship. Prayer is what makes a difference in our lives and our journey with Christ. Develop a prayer life. Become passionate in prayer. Find that warrior room of the movie of old that talked about going in for prayer, carving out time. Jesus said, get behind the door. Close the door behind you. Get into a closet and just pray. Prayer is what will change your life and those around you. Father, I just pray this word today would encourage and strengthen hearts and lives. Withness. Lord, we want to be with you. Prayer is where we're with you. In that intimacy, that communion. So Lord, I pray you bless this church, this house. Let us be a fire that rages on, Lord. Let us become a church of praying people, a church that makes a difference in the earth. Lord, we bless you in Jesus' name.
great having you with us online or otherwise. Continue to be blessed. We do have beautiful coffee over there for fellowship. Keep your masks on if, and encourage one another. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless you.